so much, Arya. Um, good morning and welcome to all of you. Uh, it's Sunday morning and everyone is here. It's very nice to see and really appreciate the enthusiasm uh, of everyone attending. Uh, the panel today is a very, very, uh, it's an issue I think which is very dear to many people's heart because of the impact rape particularly has on the society as whole well, in addition to the victim. The kind of fear, the um, kind of harm that it does uh, cannot be uh, tabulated, it cannot be understood, eh, eh, but the fear that is generated from this is one of the biggest, biggest issues that we have faced. Uh, the World Economic Forum ranks Pakistan 151 out of 153 countries. And particularly, Pakistan is seen as one of the most dangerous countries in the world for women. And this is something we have to keep highlighting over and over again, because many people say, how does this happen? Why does this happen? And the reality is because crimes such as this are very, very difficult to prosecute and convict. Between 2013 and 2020, official figures recognized 22,000 rape, only rape cases have been registered. Whereas we know that the majority of rape cases and other forms of gender-based violence are very often unreported. And out of these, the tentative conviction rate, because we don't have exact figures, is 0.8%. We do not have exact data and statistics, and it's always very difficult to get. But what I can share is currently in SIN, there are 224 cases of rape still pending before the court, and 64 cases in ICT alone. All of them, and KP, Balochistan, can also report similar figures. And the conviction rate is very, very low to maybe even up to 0.4%. So while the majority of the cases go unreported, only 0.4% of them are being convicted, there's a reason to be fearful of what the scenario is at this point. So the objectives of today's panel is to talk about implementation of law relating to rape, particularly in light of the recently passed rape legislation at the National Assembly while we wait for its signature. Uh, we have a very, very esteemed panel joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Reem Al Salam, who is uh, joining us online from Beirut. Ms. Uh, Sal Al Salam is the UN Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. She is an independent consultant who has worked on child and women protection rights for over uh, two, uh, almost two decades, I would say. Uh, she has uh, extensively worked with UNHCR in over 13 countries and has also been part of the academia, researcher, and a trainer. So we'd like to welcome you. Uh, we have Ms. Fawzia Bakar, who uh, does not need much introduction in Pakistan, and particularly in Lahore. Uh, she is a women's rights activist. She has remained chair of the Provincial Commission on the Status of Women in Punjab, and currently is uh, heading the Ra Development Center. We have Ms. Maria, who is has in her many, many different positions and capacities, has also been AIG of Gender and ICT. Uh, she is currently the, uh, in charge of the in-service training center at the National Police Academy, uh, has worked extensively on gender crimes, and we're very much looking forward to hearing perspectives of the police. On my left, we have Ms. Tita Ali, who is an advocate of the High Court, as in charge of the AGHS legal cell. Um, and we have Ms. Valerie Khan, who is a child and gender protection a specialist. We have Senator Walid Iqbal, who will be joining us shortly who is a, a chairperson of the Human Rights Com Standing Committee at the Senate. So I'd like to start off by asking a question. We're going to have a more of a conversation today as opposed to speeches. Uh, but before starting, I just do want to apologize to everyone that while many of our speakers were meant to be in person, unfortunately due to visas and COVID issues, many of them were not able to come in person today. Uh, secondly, we would also request all of you to make these conversations on human rights popular on social media. So especially anyone who's you know, very good with tweeting and Instagram and Facebook, we'd really appreciate it if you could tweet about the conference in today's session using hashtag AGCONF21. So to start off, I would like to uh, address Ms. Al Salam the very first question. Uh, Madam, there's a big presumption or a myth that crime, rape is a crime of lust or passion or sexual desires gone out of control. So I would really like to ask you that with your experience on such an international level, what do you see are the different motivations for the, and types of rape and victims of rape? So uh, what do you see around the world? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Asma Jahangir Foundation and all the organizers for this invitation. Um, if anything, the only regret that I have is that I couldn't be with you today in person. Um, I actually have been to Pakistan a number of times and I have always been very touched by uh, the hospitality and warmth of uh, its people. Now, turning to the question, yes, as you, as you say, this is one of the biggest myths. Uh, and we know that rape is not about sexual gratification or desire, it's about power, control over a person without uh, their consent. We also know that mostly it does not occur on the spur of the moment, uh, unlike what uh, many might think, but it is actually premeditated and planned. And judging by uh, the staggering numbers uh, of uh, persons that are subjected to rape, of which the majority are, of course, women and girls, um, reducing it uh, to passion or uncontrolled desire is just really wrong. Also because the implications are quite astounding of what it means to be male if we were to go uh, with this uh, proposition. So I leave you to consider that. Now, rape is a human rights violation. It's a manifestation of gender-based violence and also under international human rights law, it can amount to torture. Uh, and in fact, it's a violation of a number of rights uh, whether it's the right to autonomy, whether it's sexual autonomy, right to privacy, right to be free from violence and discrimination, and the right to the highest standard of physical and mental health. These are just uh, to name uh, a few. And as you know, under international humanitarian law and criminal law, rape can also constitute a war crime, a war ag uh, crime against humanity, and can constitute uh, um, a constitutive act with respect to genocide when other elements of the crime are present. Now, what is the key legal divide between rape and non-rape is uh, uh, the issue of consent or the lack of consent, which is uh, what the definition of rape is based on in many states, and also the use of coercive circumstances. Uh, so the latter can be the threat or actual use of violence. And the other issue is, of course, that while rape has been historically criminalized as a gender specific crime that consists of vaginal penetration of women, this has now uh, changed. So it is recognized by most states that rape can occur to any person and it can happen against any person because of their gender. So it is not limited to persons that were uh, biologically assigned the female sex at birth. And persons of diverse gender orientations and sexual orientations can also be uh, exposed to gender-based violence and also can be victims of rape. And I think we should not uh, forget that. So therefore, um, legislation today in many states is gender neutral and, and covers all uh, persons. And today also criminalization of rape explicitly includes all type of penetration, however slight, of a sexual nature uh, with any bodily uh, part or, uh, or object. Uh, I also would like to stress that many states criminalize marital rape, although there are also other uh, number of states that do not criminalize it, which is of course uh, problematic. And, and finally, there's the, the contentious issue of the age of sexual cons uh, consent. So usually what states do is they set a minimum age of sexual consent through the criminalization of rape of children under a specific age. Uh, where consent therefore is not relevant since they are not deemed capable of giving this consent. And uh, what happens therefore is that these criminal laws criminalize this type of rape as statutory rape by establishing, for example, that any sexual act with an individual below the age of 16 constitutes statutory rape with the exception where there's, for example, a maximum of three years of age of difference. And according to the information I have, the majority of states set the age of sexual consent at 15 or 16 or 18. And um, therefore, in cases involving child victims, uh, some states do eliminate the statutes of limitation also that apply to adults. Um, yes, I'll leave it here. Thank you so much. I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, Senator Valid Iqbal. Uh, Senator Saab, we introduced you in your absentia. Uh, but just to uh, remind everyone is that uh, Senator Valid Iqbal, amongst his many, many other accolades, is also currently chairperson of the Senate Committee, uh, Standing Committee on Human Rights. Uh, additionally, he is also a lawyer and holds a degree in economics as well as philosophy. Uh, so we'd like to welcome you, sir, officially. Uh, so for uh, Ms. Fawzia Vakar, I'd like to turn over to you now. 
uh, Ms. Salam gave a very detailed overview of what the legislation in different jurisdictions looks like. Uh, in Pakistan, what are the specific social and cultural circumstances surrounding the incidents of rape? Uh, particularly relating to uh, uh, th themes that Ms. Al Salam discussed, particularly those involving, uh, you know, power and control, and the questions about consent and lack of consent. Uh, particularly, if I also may add one dimension in the framework of the issues and challenges that we've had revolving child marriage. Thank you, Malia. I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Asma Jahangi Foundation for this wonderful conference every year where I feel that there is an uninhibited conversation on rights and ways forward for us to promote democracy, My need of the hour really. Um, and I thank you for this session also. I think Reem um, has, uh, Ms. Reem has really set the tone for what I had to say because your question on social, um, the social context of it is what is fundamental in addressing rape. Because I feel that even though we have uh, much cause to celebrate uh, effective legislation, especially the recent legislation, on which is the Anti-Rape Investigation and Trial um, Act of 2021, it, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, which um, makes the, frame, the legal framework to punish rape quite effective. I feel our problem is not legislation as much as it is the social context which leads to perpetration of rape. Because I feel like much as Ms. Aslan said, rape is really an exercise of power. It is always perpetrated on the weak, really. Hence, you know, uh, the definition of rape which deals with women and children. It is the disempowerment of women and children, really, which subjects them to rape. And even when you look at the system, the way it is constructed, generally, the victims of rape do not get justice because of the fact that they either do not have the money to pursue their cases or they don't have the resources to be able to get justice. The system seems to be inclined towards uh, denial of justice, I guess, in one form or another to the victims. If you talk to, I'm not going to go into the specifics of the law, which late in the, I know that in the later uh, round of uh, questions we are going to address, but you'll see that within the criminal justice uh, sector, there is a general perception that rape complaints are fake. And I have Ms. Maria sitting here also, who is going to probably talk about it also, maybe in a more sympathetic manner. But if you talk to lawyer, not uh, necessarily lawyer, but if you talk to the police officers, male police officers and judges, and I have spoken with many in institutional forums, the general observation is that 98% of the rape cases are fake. Perhaps, yes, I agree. Maybe many of them are fake. But we have to look at the definition of fake. What is it that has made them fake? Whether it is the resiling of the victim or the witness, which leads you to declare them fake, or the fact is that the victim, let's say, withdraws the case, or the most important matter over here is when the, uh, a woman has been used to file a complaint of rape, by one family, by one tribe, by one household, to in order to get even with another family, house, household, or tribe, uh, or tribe, you know, the woman has been raped, but it was to use her in order to get even with someone else. So, if that is the definition of fake, I don't see that as fake. You know, the rape has happened; the woman has been used, and where is it? You know, so the, really, I think we need to address the issue of denial of power to women, which leads to all these issues of uh, you know, fake complaints also. Similarly, I want to address another matter, which is um, consent. You know, consent is fundamental in any sexual relationship. We all know, and here I see all lawyers. The definition of rape where um, you know, a child now, the Anti-Rape Investigation and Trial Ordinance has declared that statutory rape is any child, whether a boy or girl, below the age of 16. We have inconsistencies in laws also where, you know, child marriage does not recognize children as under the age of 18. So where does the consent come from? I feel that is another lacuna also. And finally, I know other people need to speak. We, as a society, have a lot of rape apologists in our decision making. 
And unless and until we really take the bull by the horns, we declare that rape is an offence, that we stop apologising. For women's, you know, for men's action, because women are dressed in X, Y or Z manner, we are not going to be able to address rape, no matter how effective the legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, leading to exactly from what uh, Fosia talked about, uh, particularly victims who are uh, resiling or compromising cases out of court. Now, this is one of the biggest findings that we have in many, many studies. In a study that Legal Aid Society did for SINTH showed that over 58 to 60 percent of cases are settled out of court or where the victim resiles. Similar statistics are being seen in Islamabad, Punjab, KP, and Balochistan. Um, which is interesting because rape is a non-compoundable offense under the law, which means it cannot be compromised and the court must pursue its case. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Nidali, I'd like to ask you, what is the legal impact of compromise in court and in court practice? Because there's law and then there's court practice. And how should the criminal justice system re respond to situations where you can see the victim or the complainant are clearly residing? Uh, what are the strategies that we could apply and what does it actually do to the case? Thank you, Maliha. The reason why we have a very uh, low conviction rate, which is 2%, and a high acquittal rate, almost more than 98%, is the reason of because of the deficit in our legal justice system. Other than the other barricades that we have that defeats justice or st stops the delivery of justice to victims or survivors of sexual violence, one of the biggest reasons that the justice fails them is because cases are compromised out of the court. Now, rape, as you said, is a non-compoundable offense under the law. There is absolutely no justification for allowing the accused and the survivor to compromise. However, because in our system, what happens is that because sexual violence against women is not considered a priority area, it, the failure of the system starts with the first uh, instance, which is the first responder, the police. The uh, report is uh, not registered in time. Key evidence is lost, and the Chalan, which is the invest investigation report, is filed about, it should be filed under the law within 14 days, but it takes months to file that report. Now, this is the time, which is crucial time, when the case should be already be under trial. The delay causes, and we've already established that it's a crime of power. So the victim is often very vulnerable, has no legal resources, financial backing, and often no family support. So when this Thing, this whole issue is delayed because of a justice system. It gives the opportunity to the, accu to the accused to pressurize the victim into resiling or uh, seeking a compromise, which is in Urdu called the Razi Nama. Now, I mean, with what happens is that they, we can see the intention of the accused going to the court by filing an FIR with the police and then also by go giving a statement in the court. After that, what we've noticed in our experience is that most of the cases do not, are not followed through by the victim. And most of them resile out of the court, it being a non-compatible offense, there's a Ramin, uh, Razi Nama between the parties. The way to handle this issue is that there should be accountability mechanisms in place. Anybody who strikes a deal between the accused, who initiates or enables a deal, should be punished under the, under the law. Why this, the reason why this offense goes, uh, uh, totally uh, gets no justice is for only for the reason that there is no accountability mechanisms in place for the police, there is no accountability for the pr prosecution, and mostly what is illegal is the compatibility element. We, are we, in my experience, in my office's experience, we have never seen, despite hundreds and thousands of Razi Namas and compromises, not one person has been brought under the law for striking a deal outside the court. Thank you so much for that. Um, it, it's, it's a, it, it is a scary situation when we see realities such as this. Uh, Ms. Ramya, I'd like to turn over to you. You've worked extensively with the judiciary in recent years, particularly with child reports and GBT courts. What has been the judicial response overall in dealing with cases of rape or different kinds of sexual abuse and violence? Uh, well, the, the judiciary in, in Pakistan has had a, quite a, an open response to the issue. I think they have actually heard the public outcry uh, related to this issue of sexual violence. 
and uh, have decided to go beyond the hearing and to take into consideration, which I think is quite an amazing feat actually, the recommendation of the experts on the topic. So what the judiciary has done through the National Judicial Policy Making Committee, that they have um, decided to set up gender-based violence courts in each district and they have also, so to deal with uh, cases of GBV, which include sexual violence, but not only, and mostly targeting, mostly targeting uh, adult victims. Uh, whereas the judiciary for the children have decided to pilot in each, that was the initial plan, uh, main capital of each province, uh, a child court, uh, where cases where children in conflict which means accused of a crime or in contact with the law, which means victim or witness to such crime, could uh, avail a more uh, sensitive justice. Concretely speaking, this translated, and I'll start with the child courts, into transforming a space, an already existing space, where the child could wait and give his state, he or her statement away from the accused and where the, the judicial team, the prosecution, as well as the lawyers would be specifically trained on child-sensitive procedures, as well as what we call forensic communication. We know that one of the main reasons for not giving the best evidence is the trauma and the secondary victimization that children, women, and, and any victim of sexual violence, to be honest, experiences at the investigation, the pre-trial, at the trial stage, and at the post-trial stage even, with you know threats, intimidation, or whatever. So the judiciary is taking action to change the setup, change mindset, and in addition to establishing those child courts or GBD courts, they have also launched a massive capacity building program. I insist on the fact that it's not only training, but capacity building, because there was a need assessment the, the, the modules that are developed are very much based on what is needed. They also are tuned and adjusted to the specific needs of the judicial teams. And, and they're also monitored. So, so after delivering those training and coaching those judicial team and those justice actors teams, because they didn't, um, the Judicial Academy has a mandate to train justice actors and not only judges. So prosecutors, lawyers, uh, judicial officers, as well as um, <coughs> probation officers, social workers, and some lawyers were also trained on the, on the topic. And, and, and by collecting some data, we could look at what was working, identifying the best practices, but also identifying the improving areas, and then going further. So I'll just close there in the sense that it's work in progress. We are not saying that everything is perfect, but the model that have been piloted uh, for several GP courts, not all, but several, and for the 13 pilot child courts currently existing in Pakistan are highly positive and that conviction rate in the child courts and the GBD court seven that have been piloted has increased between four to seven percent of conviction rates and the, the victims are, you know, tend to reside less, to go less for protocol settlement and also they are satisfied with the kind of attitude, which means that they report more, they are more eager, I would say, to go for, for the persecution because the team is, is adequate. Um, and that has been, uh, I just wanted to point out, because the room is here, that this uh, child court establishment by, by Pakistan and the data monitoring of the scores has been identified by the Special Rapporteur uh, to Violence Against Children as an example of good practice and by the world uh, organization against torture as one of the good practices in the world. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Valerie. It's good to hear some positivity <laughs> uh, in this realm, particularly with the uh, topic at hand. Uh, uh, Ms. Esri uh, Mariam, I'd like to ask you that specifically. Now, there are many accusations and uh, you know, things which are said about the police and the quality of their investigation or the effectiveness of their uh, investigation. What challenges uh, have you seen the police face, particularly in investigation and uh, pursuit of cases of rape and so on? Congratulations on arranging a wonderful, putting together such a good conference and uh, thank you for inviting me over because um, I really see that uh, police being a very important stakeholder and uh, um, as everybody puts it, uh, being the gatekeepers of the criminal justice system, it's really our responsibility to explain our part of the problem. 
because solutions are usually wrapped up within um, the problem and you really have to find it and you really have to find where um, everybody is putting, doing or not doing their uh, uh, share of the job. As you pointed out, and um, I will restrict myself to only the anti-rape legislation part because really this is a, a big complex problem and complex problems always require complex solutions. Uh, but as far as this progressive legislation is concerned, um, I'm very happy to say that uh, now we are uh, very uh, safely um, legislated as far as uh, anti-rape law is concerned. We have had a few laws before that. Uh, but a few strengths of this uh, anti-rape law is the special courts that have been envisioned in the special committee the NTA crisis centers. Uh, these anti rape crisis centers, I must add here, are for SARC uh, back in the UK and they've been there for the last two decades. Uh, they are a good practice and they are a good intervention there, uh, but it's a very focused approach uh, with which the British police works there. Um, and um, they also realize that uh, what probably is lacking in the law is uh, that there are three really components of the anti rape uh, crisis centers. Number one is the forensics part, number two is the evidence collection part. And number three is the aftercare services. Um, so uh, uh, probably this is a good idea to probably amend the law um, if it is uh, deemed suitable to add these things because that really enables uh, the whole criminal justice system in general and the police in particular uh, to process the case well. Um, as far as uh, the question uh, goes of uh, faulty investigations and uh, uh, not uh, being sensitized, uh, to the rape, either the legislation, the law, or um, the FIR part of it. Um, I, I really must uh, uh, emphasize here that police, uh, with all its uh, shortcomings of uh, resources and of capacity and of training, um, is really doing a wonderful job when it comes to our counterterrorism departments. Do a lot of very tricky investigations. You randomly go and pick up any district in uh, the whole of the country, and uh, very small district, very small. Uh, trained police and they are still tracing and investigating and detecting blind murders and double murders and whatnot. So I really think it's more of an issue of sensitization and training and mainstreaming of uh, more women into the um, uh, you know police force and also uh, training them repeatedly. Uh, plus it has to be an approach when it comes to the sensitization part uh, that it has to be a top-down approach. Uh, because um, the po police, the junior ranks, they respond really well to the trainings and to the sensitization. Uh, and given the social context, um, probably the trainings come in handy uh, there as well. Because the social fabric where uh, you have the unequal distribution of power, as uh, Ms. Reem pointed out and then Manaposia pointed out, I think it is really an un unequal distribution of power, the power relations. And I would also add that uh, this unequal power relationing, uh, the power that a person feels, uh, people usually, complainants come to us, uh, usually with, they are very educated ladies, very empowered ladies, but they are usually being harassed at, um, you know, in the streets, uh, in public spaces, uh, by somebody who is not even uh, employed, uneducated, because it's the power that a man has to make a woman feel uncomfortable. Such is the magnitude of the problem that we face. Even then, we are trying uh, to uh, sensitize the police uh, and to train them and to build their capacity, but I'm uh, sure that if I have um, diagnosed the problem well, probably it's a matter of uh, priority more than capacity or training or anything else. So probably if we make it a, a priority with the police, which I'm happy in the last decade or so with more uh, female officers joining uh, the police service, uh, not only at the junior ranks level, but at the officers level, um, I, I think that there is a natural um, tendency of the police to get sensitized when you see more women around, you know that it's a, it's a natural phenomenon. And uh, women are here uh, and they will prosper and they will make it to leadership positions. So they also have a say and a voice uh, for the vulnerable groups for women. And I really do not restrict myself only to women. I uh, usually say that all the vulnerable groups, any person who is really in a um, position of vulnerability, uh, is, police is really the only one, um, you know, after God, who, who can respond to that. Really, uh, you know, it's a matter of justice and police can really 
dispense with a lot of justice and relief when it comes to uh, all these people. Uh, so I'll just restrict my comments uh, till here. I'm sure there are some questions as well. Uh, but uh, again, coming back to your question, uh, probably it's, uh, it's a matter of prioritizing our, uh, the, the way we approach uh, the whole question of rape and gender-based violence. Uh, and probably if we get there, uh, naturally a lot of problems are going to resolve themselves. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam. I think it's encouraging to hear uh, the fact that specialization is something that you know we've talked about. We have the child courts, we have the GBV courts, we have the gender protection unit in Islamabad, uh, GBV investigating officers in Karachi. It's encouraging to see that this um, you, uh, is presumably going to have an even more positive effect. Uh, Senator Walid Iqbal, I'd like to ask you, over the last six months since you've become chairman of the Senate Standing Committee of Human Rights, what has your particular experience taught you about the practical aspects of implementations of law relating to sex crimes? And also, if I may also ask you, where do you see this recent anti-rape law heading in the context of uh, the time to come? Thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me, thank you very much, and my compliments to the organizers of the Asma Jahangir conference. There is uh, this great uh, proclivity, I'm going to drag, digress for a minute, if you will permit me, there's, there's this great proclivity of these conferences to grab the headlines, as I noticed this morning. Um, I'll, I'll make my, uh, you know, give my two bits on that also. I was, it was my pleasure to be here uh, two years ago, and on this very rostrum, I, I made a statement which grabbed some headlines, not as big as the headlines I've seen today. And uh, it was the subject of some tickers, and those tickers were to the effect that, naming me, it was said that I spoke too much of the truth. And I will repeat what I said, uh, standing here, uh, and I will, there is a context because of this present conference of today and yesterday. I had said that Article 62 f of the Constitution which was introduced by General Ziaul Haq to control politicians is actually the new 58 2B uh, for, uh, it is not about um, accountability, it is not about corruption, it is about regime change. And I had expressed my candid views on that uh, because I think the subject was something similar on that occasion. And that is what grabbed the headlines on that occasion, but what I uh, am feeling doubly satisfied about of having said that on that occasion uh, and on this occasion that yesterday the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association said almost exactly the same thing, that Article 62 one f of the Constitution is something that we need to revisit. And if I, I didn't read the whole news item, but he has made a statement from this platform that Article 62 one f needs to be struck down. Uh, so um, that is something I wanted to, uh, as a preamble, I wanted to uh, make mention of. Um, as uh, chairman of the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights, Rights which uh, I had the honor of being elected uh, uh, early in June 2021, we have taken up uh, several laws, uh, starting with the law for the protection of senior citizens, with law against domestic violence, which is now back in the National Assembly, law protecting domestic workers, uh, law against corporal punishment, and then in the upcoming meetings, we are going to be taking up uh, some legislation involving child protection, uh, legislation involving uh, protection of transgender persons, and we are taking up the Jokshio case and another case involving uh, you know, an incident of rape at a university in Balochistan. Uh, other than legislation, we have taken up the Noor Mukaddam case. We took it up promptly after the Eid holidays during which the incident occurred. We, the IG police of Islamabad, the Secretary of Interior, and the entire team was there. We took up the, promptly after Pakistan's Independence Day, we took up the uh, Minare Pakistan incident involving the uh, manhandling of a woman by a mob. And uh, um, actually, uh, in the course of those, uh, you know, taking up those, uh, you know, pieces of legislation and those particular cases, uh, we also learned from uh, Senator Mushayud Hussain, who's a member of the committee, that on that very same day, the uh, Independence Day weekend, there was an incident in, the, in a park in uh, Islamabad also, where a deputy high commissioner of one of the Commonwealth countries, uh, one of, I think Ghana or uh, uh, Tanzania, one of those countries, was, w faced uh, um, some sort of molestation by a crowd. 
what has this taught me because i poured over this a lot and we have had a long discussion in view particularly of the noor muqaddam case the minare pakistan incident uh, and those other incidents similar incidents uh, uh, that 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 took place uh, in in recent months and not for the first time there have been similar incidents in earlier years as well the first thing that i have understood and i want to uh, posit uh, and i i can see that there are uh, opinion makers here legislators are also participating in this conference the police uh, officials are present um as one headline item i i believe uh, that it is not oh, of course all this new legislation is coming with new definitions new punishments uh, uh, better investigation tools and things like that but what i have learned is that and now history is also empirical evidence also confirms this that it is not this the severity of the punishment that actually uh, 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 overcomes incidents of crime and particularly crimes uh, involving violence against women it is not the severity of the punishment it is the certainty of the punishment if a perpetrator is aware that the law will chase up after him if he or she is aware that the law will bring him or her into the dock and will punish him and not that you know he or she is above the law or somebody or the other will intervene and you know um, you know make the law sort of inapplicable uh, the, the the reason why i'm saying this is because there is a section 354a of pakistan penal code it addresses exactly the kind of incident that occurred at minare pakistan on the 14th of august 2021 and mind you there was a similar incident there was a documentary filmmaker who had gone to the mazar of the qaid azam mohammad ali jana and a similar incident took place and there were four policemen standing and watching and uh, after she was able to disengage her and her crew uh, uh, from the mob she went to those policemen and said you know why didn't you come and uh, you know try and stop this and they said you know though they were 200 people we are just four why did you even come here so uh, section 354 a of the pakistan penal code prescribes death penalty life imprisonment for assault or use of criminal force to uh, a woman and stripping her of her clothes and this has been on the statute books through a presidential ordinance by general jaul haq in 1984 so for 30 uh, something years this law has been on the statute books but it did not deter a crime of this nature because of you know there is there is no there is no certainty of the punishment what punishment can be more severe than capital punishment so that's the first thing madam that the certainty of a punishment so there is this that's the issue that addresses the practical aspect uh, that is the issue that addresses the implementation because that involves across the board uh, you know will and uh, um, uh, a culture of you know enforcing the rule of law so it's number one the certainty of punishment not the severity of punishment the second thing is that uh, in our uh, and i've just exemplified that in 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 our sort of a patriarchal society we are faced with the uh, and i don't think this issue has been addressed here so far uh, victim blaming particularly you know that it is always the victim not the perpetrator you know uh, particularly if the victim is a woman and mind you when we were looking into the minare pakistan incident there was an incident of gang rape just around that time in the university of mysore in india and uh, uh, to add insult to injury the uh, administration of the university the vice chancellor issued a notification that women cannot go out on the campus after 6 pm uh, so that also it's not just us here in pakistan and the you know sort of the uh, you know conservative uh, you know islamic mindset it is actually a subcontinental and a wider cultural mindset over here which i i believe uh, after i'm talking about the punishment side comes from training comes from education comes from training in the schools and training you know overtly and also at the subliminal level training at home that you know those people who Uh, pass not or issue notifications or pass laws you know uh, restraining women from going out uh, at a, after a certain hour or saying that women shouldn't dress like this or dress like that you know the same people should actually teach or train their the men in their family their male children 
that you know they are the ones who need to respect women they are the ones who need to respect the rule of the law and, and they are the ones who have to adhere <laughs> and that can only come through taleem in schools and tarbiyat at home so there are two aspects of training and the overt and the subliminal and third and last but not least uh, what i what I, what this has taught me is also uh, these uh, these kinds of crimes can be overcome through a narrative building building a narrative now there i can see some media not a whole lot of cameras rolling and whirring over here but th there is there has to be a narrative building and the kind of content we have on the electronic and the social media i believe right now i believe if only 15% of that my estimate 15 to 20% of that content if there is a narrative building against violence that is perpetrated against women or against children or the uh, uh, sex crimes of all sorts if that kind of a narrative is built and there is a narrative against it and a consistent and a broad ranging narrative that will also enable us i mean this won't happen overnight but that is what i believe in my experience as the chairman of the senate standing committee on human rights that is what i have come to understand and uh, and i do understand i recognize i represent the government and i believe this government wants to promote tourism i know that i i believe this government wants to promote investment now if we have incidents like mirare pakistan or the one that the diplomat in, in islamabad encountered how can we expect people to come here with their families how can we expect people to come and invest their money so these are the things which i believe we need to do and to conclude where particularly this anti rape uh, uh, legislation uh, i didn't mention it in the in the context of the standing committee on human rights um that legislation was referred to the standing committee on law and justice which is chaired by barrister ali zafar we have stalwarts like raza rabani and farooq naik and azam nazir tarar in that committee uh, however uh, the committee added uh, and improved on that law but it lapsed before uh, you know the constitutionally stipulated within that constitutionally stipulated period so it has been now uh, uh, you know uh, passed and enacted in the joint session where it is headed that answer i have already given you uh, it will of course it involves all those many things about new investigation techniques new punishments new definitions etc etc although the chemical castration has been taken out uh, it will it will uh, encounter the same fate i believe as all the other, i mean the legislation and the laws that have been on the statute books since 1984 if you know there is no certainty of punishment certainty of punishment will actually take care of the issue not the severity thank you very much uh thank you so much uh, senator sahab i completely agree with everything that you're saying uh because i do believe that certainty makes a lot of difference and we keep giving this example is that the minute the traffic police you enter the motorway everyone puts on their seat belts they come into the you know speed limit because they know there's a certainty of punishment if uh they do not do so so i think that 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 is a very very important point to make uh but coming from that i'd like to actually move on to the specific legislation which has recently been passed and i'd like to actually ask all the panelists this question um starting from uh, you know ms fozia about where do you think uh the challenges of actually implementing this law are going to lie so uh maliha just for the sake of the audience i'd like to clarify or rather talk about some of the things that the new law gives us the law talks about anti rape crisis cells in public hospitals it talks about uh, the special courts which we in punjab referred to as gbv courts since 2016 when sops as well as guidelines were issued to establish gender based violence courts with special dispensation similarly the law puts a time frame on uh, the various parts of investigation or the continuum of investigation it uh, provides for victim and witness protection it talks against or rather gives provision or has provisions against um, people who resile resiling in courts etc and it has various other mechanisms um which relate to the the process itself the investigation and trial itself also which are very helpful so those are the good parts of it it also gives the prime minister the ability to appoint uh, or rather to declare certain courts 
as GBV courts or the special courts, and to appoint uh, specific officers, police officers, as the GBV officers or the anti-rape officers or whatever. Well, I guess the first challenge that I it might be because of lack of my understanding or also because the law is not fully available at the moment is that policing and judiciary, they are both provincial subjects. So uh, how does that take care of the constitutional uh, amendment, 18th Amendment and the devolution? Uh, if everything is going to flow from the Federation, how does that get addressed? That is, that is a, uh, I think, a challenge that we need to address. The second thing is that um, this we are hailing this law as uh, you know, as if it's bringing everything anew. But like I just said, in 2016, Punjab announced GBV courts to take care of sexual and gen gender-based or sexual crimes. What happened was, with the passage of time, despite all the good intentions, after the Salman Akram Raja case, you know, when the Supreme Court had given guidelines on how rape is going to be investigated, how women police officers will be deputed, etc. We got all that, but then when leadership was gone from it, when the priority, as Ms. Maria talked about, was taken away from gender-based violence crime, it all fell through. We have one GBV court in Lahore. I'm happy to see there are more child courts, but we don't have the special courts uh, that the law talks about anymore, although the space was there. So it's about resourcing. It's about providing leadership to the issue. Unless that happens, I can tell you nothing is going to change. Policing is not going to change. You know, in 2014 onwards, Punjab uh, brought about this whole concept of, and I think it flows from the Salman Akram Raja case in 2014, the Supreme Court case, where special women, you know, uh, gender-based violence units were going to be established in all the police divisions, where special prosecutors were going to assist the GBV courts, and GBV courts were going to be established. That fell through. You know, now you see, after all that hype that was created, uh, and after all the smart women police officers invested in the issue of uh, sexual and gender-based crimes, they were appointed, special prosecutors who were women who were appointed, it all fell through because nothing came out of it. After that one court, I have, well, at least I haven't seen any more courts. And if we are going to take this across the country, it's not about the law, like uh, Senator Saab also said. It's about providing leadership to it. It's about going beyond the narrative, beyond the rhetoric, I should say, and resourcing it. Thirdly, I feel the challenge is going to be accountability. The certainty of punishment comes from tangible mechanisms for accountability. Where is it sit written in the police officers or police uh, officials uh, ACR that you have to show convictions or you have to show re a, rec a positive record on gender-based violence uh, crimes. So unless we build that into the performance of the, the police, the prosecutors, and the judges, we are not going to get accountability uh, that we are expecting uh, to have. And I think finally, I agree that Talim o Tarbiyat is very, very important. And we need to do that formally, perhaps, in the law, where people know that this is a, a punishment for law. But we also uh, you know, build the narrative. I don't think the current narrative is about punishing rape. It's about apologizing for rape. And unless we address that, I don't think we are going to have uh, implementation of the law. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Rosia. I, I do want to actually share is that the National Judicial Policy Making Committee of the uh, Judiciary actually has created gender-based violence courts which are functioning across the country. Uh, so the organization that I work with, Legal Aid Society in Sindh, has worked extensively with 27 GBV courts in Sindh. And uh, similar to the work that uh, uh, Group Development Foundation and Valerie has been doing, is that there has been an increased satisfaction level amongst the people who are accessing it. So in Sindh, in particularly, we conducted a user satisfaction survey of the people who were accessing the courts, which includes the accused, the victim, the witnesses, and there was a 14% increased satisfaction, uh, particularly in courts where special protection mechanisms such, such as waiting rooms, screens, in-camera trials were being implemented. So I do feel that you know the, the specialization is one step forward, and we've seen uh, in Sindh we have 288 gender-based violence investigating officers that were uh, established and are currently undergoing training um, and capacity building, as Valerie said. 
Uh, but Madam Mary, I'd like to turn to you uh, because it keeps coming back to the police as well. Is that uh, how do you see this law and particularly the new structure such as the anti-rape crisis cell? Uh, how do you see that uh, being translated into an on-ground reality? And what would be your recommendations from a police perspective about how to improve the attitude and perceptions within the police? I know you mentioned increased female officers, but how do you actually get them into leadership position? I think this is a very pertinent question, and I will take a lead from what uh, uh, Madam Fozia said about um, you know the the things that uh, policing being a provincial subject. How does uh, the law get uh, trickled down uh, down to the level of provinces and down to the level of chiefs of police or the IGPs as we call them? Because as I understand from the law that the prime minister is um, uh, in in the law uh, uh, is the authorized person to initiate the uh, the cells, the rape crisis centers. Uh, so I believe that uh, uh, if we trust police enough, I think a chief of police is um, high enough a level of command that they can always initiate the uh, crisis centers themselves because it's a very um, uh, a time costly and probably it will take some time. So if we really want it to get translated uh, into action immediately, I don't really think that uh, unless that the prime minister really has time to sit down for it, uh, it, will, it will cost uh, some time. Uh, secondly, um, I'm really concerned about the accountability metrics that has been defined there uh, because, first of all, there, there seems to be a dichotomy between what it says that uh, either the commissioner or the deputy commissioner is going to head the, the cell uh, and then they are going to be uh, DITs and etc. Cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to what in the last seven decades what uh, we have seen and my own experience of uh, almost 14 years of uh, policing, that um, wherever there is a accountability matrix, it always falls upon the shoulders of police and somebody gets uh, punished. I, I'm sure that uh, there are so many complaints of police not being punished for their faulty investigations. But uh, as you can see from the Minare Pakistan incident or so many other incidents of gender-based violence in the, uh, in the recent years, um, basically the uh, matrix has to um, include everyone in the flow of the criminal justice. It has to be the prosecutors. The, uh, many a times uh, when I was investigating a lot of sexual assault cases of whether women or children, uh, the medical legal reports are very questionable. The doctors simply, uh, the lady doctors, they are in fear of, um, you know, out of fear of reporting the right crime. They say that uh, we are sending the DNA to uh, such and such uh, lab and we are sending this uh, evidence to such and such lab. And, you know, they basically try to remain in the shadows. So it's if it's really the police doing the job, um, uh, as I understand, a lot of the investigating officers who are good investigating officers, they try to stay away from the assault cases. Because usually the outcomes are very much, you know, it's sort of an open and shut case for them. Because they know uh, somebody is going to resile, somebody is going to go for an out-of-court settlement. So it's really a mess for us. Uh, so I'm really concerned that if it's, it has to be an accountability, it has to be for the whole flow of the flow. Everybody has to be responsible for the wrong or right decisions that they make. Uh, secondly, um, I would really uh, want to see that uh, it talks about there are so many good things in it and uh, having an independent support advisor is a very good initiative in it. But it, uh, the advisor must accompany uh, every victim and must not uh, be um, you know, put at the discretion of the head of the crisis cell, which I earlier pointed out must be uh, either um, an RPO or a DPO. It has to be a police officer because if our understanding is that so much is going wrong with the, within the uh, police investigation and the response of the police, then we really must make it a, the problem of the police. And uh, I don't know how so many cake, uh, cooks uh, you know, spoiling the broth would solve the problem. Uh, and then while uh, framing uh, the, the rules, uh, we must uh, understand that once you have the law and then uh, you have the procedures and then you really have to um, confine it to the, the rules the rules of the business as we call them. So uh, at the level of the police, an effort uh, is being made in, in the last year or so, so that we are able to frame some rules according to the law so that there is some SOP, how we are supposed to respond to such an incident, who is supposed to be there, who is uh, the one who is the first responder, has to collect what from there. And then uh, we can really point a finger at who was responsible and did not uh, do the job well. And lastly, uh, 
um, I must uh, appreciate the concept of uh, keeping a register for sex offenders. Uh, that's a practical solution, but again, there is this whole um, mix-up of uh, uh, keeping the database where, because uh, as we understand that Nadra is the custodian of all the database, but I think that we must trust the police enough that we can keep a register of sex offenders with us, and then we can uh, actually, because we have a criminal record uh, office with us, it's a digitalized CRO for the last uh, 10 years or so, and it's uh, uh, a lot of data shared, uh, being shared at the provincial level, interprovincial. We have the database of uh, SIN being shared <coughs> with Punjab, being shared with KP. So I think that uh, we can keep a diary, and that, that will actually help the police, and it will also help with the promptness. Uh, that is the the, uh, the quickness of response that is expected of the police, probably it will help there. And lastly, this just a clear uh, flow of chain of command and of responsibility. It has to be there. Otherwise, if it's uh, it's all messed up, I, um, I think that there is going to be uh, every, every person saying that it was not my responsibility. So uh, it, it, we work in a hierarchy. We... Uh, the uniform services, they work in a very defined hierarchy. So it has to be in a hierarchical fashion that um, the, all the things, the JITs, the committees, um, and the crisis centers, the responsibility of who is going to be the head of the crisis center, it has to be done in a very clear manner. It has to be transparent, and, and it must really enunciate who is responsible for what part of the job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm just moving on to uh, Nida. I apologize that I'm going to ask you to be a little quick because we're running a bit short of time. Uh, but specifically, could you also comment in your response about the, in the need for integration between all the different actors of the criminal justice system and how that could be a challenge to the implementation of the law? First, I'll come to the accountability issue, yes. which is very, no, the implementation issue. There is no dearth of laws in Pakistan, but the issue has always been the implementation. The rape laws existed, even they were amended in 2016 also. Coming forward to 2021, we have new legislation, but was, the question is, was 2016 law implemented ever? It was not, because while the governments are very active in making legislation, there is absolutely no implementation strategy followed uh, this, and the reason, Okay, so we, and then number two are the lack of resources. Now, you know, Maria is here, so um, there is a recent judgment in the uh, Lahore High Court by Atif uh, Bajwa. He, they, there were 34,000 cases registered under the new anti-rape uh, anti law uh, legislation, but none of them were tried according to this law, the provision in, in this law. No JIT was formed and there was no mechanism followed. The CCPO was asked to respond to it that why was this mechanism not followed. He gave a detailed reply that there were no <laughs> resources allocated to us. So in the end, he also gave an invoice uh, for, the, uh, for ma making JITs. He said that we need 4.5 billion rupees to make an infrastructure for accountability centers, for these centers, for investigation centers, sorry. And we need 1.5 billion to run them. So whilst you make a law and you don't have an implementation strategy for allocating resources, nothing is going to happen here. Then there's also a shortcoming in understanding how to implement the law. For instance, we only have one GBV court in Lahore, which is also not uh, uh, legally recognized because it was made by Justice Mansoor Ali Shah and a lot of judges do not recognize saying it has no legal validity. It was not made through the law. So now what has happened is the government currently has issued a notification, the Law and Justice Commission, that all session courts are now declared as special courts. Now you can't declare all session courts as special courts, then how do you identify that the gender cases will go here and rest of the cases? So in the end, all cases will be tried in the same co courts without any safeguards in the place. Lastly, accountability is a huge issue. In our experience at AGHS, we have never seen that if there is police failure or if the pr prosecution does not coordinate as the law mandates with the uh, police or the judiciary does not uh, uh, conclude the trial in four months as stipulated in the previous law, there's a direction to conclude the trial in four months in 2016 law, in the current law, no, in the current law is four months and the previous one it was three months. If the 
trial does not conclude, there is no accountability. A reg normally, a regular rape trial takes two to three years to conclude. So witnesses lose in, uh, the witnesses lose victim or the survivor is the primary uh, witness. So they lose interest in the case. They, the offense is compounded or they are influenced to withdraw the case. So these are the implementation issues that look they need to be focused on. We are very active with making laws, but with no implementation strategy. Uh, thank you so much, Nida. And I think I'd like to echo particularly with the timelines. Even research that we've done in SIND under the Legal Aid Society, it uh, calculated that approximately for one rape or sodomy case, it takes about 16.4 months. Whereas uh, 1.3 months is spent in investigation, 4.3 months are spent at the magistrate st stage, and 9.6 months approximately spent at trial. Oh, as compared to the two weeks, it's supposed to be an investigation. Nobody calculates the magistrate time period. And then it goes into the three months at that point and four months now at the trial stage. Uh, Valerie, I'd like to come to you quickly and as brief as possible. Is that how has the collection of data particularly helped with the accountability of the child courts? Because as you mentioned, that it's something that's been hailed as a success. So how would you, um, you know, what advice would you give on making um, well, first of all, the indicators of the data were developed in collaboration with the National Judicial Policy Making Committee, which means we had ownership of the, uh, I don't, I will not call it monitoring because we, uh, I mean, we did it as, uh, you know, civil society experts, but the, the assessment of the perf uh, court performance. So there was ownership, there was willingness to do it, and, you know, they are judges, so they want evidence. To before moving forward or before examining anything. So we gave them, uh, based on agreed indicators, evidence of what was working and what was uh, not working or what needed improvement. And that basically helped them to convince their colleagues and their team, including the, the session judges who mark the cases to those special courts, that's very important, to work better, to, to change, to improve, also to acknowledge, and that's very important, once you convince those justice actors that you can do things differently for the best interest of the child, for an improved dispensation of justice, it's also extremely important, and we forget that. You know, we keep on criticizing as a, as a, as a psychosocial, um, a worker, I feel that it's very important to acknowledge the judges and the police officers who work well when you are also on the other side pointing out the ones who don't. So that data allowed us to say, well, you're doing a fabulous job, let's continue, this is what we need to do better. And also, it was used by the judiciary to convince the government to allocate additional resources to establish, to upscale those functioning models. I think the challenge we're going to have now, you know, in terms of accountability, the law uh, provides an oversight committee with a lot of civil society experts. But what we need to ensure is that the model that have been proven working better or efficient are upscaled, are monitored, are documented, are shared, and that uh, this, uh, what do you call that, this upscaling is also included, it's not always additional resource management allocation, sorry, additional resource allocation, but rather improve resource management as well. That's another aspect that needs to be taken into consideration. And then lastly, I think, what the data uh, from the judiciary says is that rather than putting the things under the carpet, they had the, the courage, we need to acknowledge that, to face the problem and that's how you end up because I believe in Pakistan potential and extraordinary capacity to deliver once we decide to do so, to actually set up, I repeat, example of best practices in the world. It's not a small feat. Let's do that and let's go further based on those uh, foundations. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, I know we're, we're re very much run over time, and I can see Dr. Pervez, her voice sitting right in front of me, so making me very conscious of that. But I'd like to just uh, come to just two quick points from uh, Senator Saab and uh, from Ms. Uh, Reem as well. Uh, Senator Saab, we've talked a lot about accountability. Uh, as uh, you know, the chair of the standing committee, how do you see uh, your role, your, your committee's role in this accountability, particularly as the, you, you would be the cross-body over elections and changing governments and all of that. How do you continue to see your role in accountability of this law? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm almost the last speaker. Second last. Second last. 
So I have, well, I'll just play on the last but not least. I am last and I have to say the least. We have taken oath to all of myself and all the other members of the committee who are senators have taken oath to preserve, protect and defend the constitution. And in particular, I want to highlight what is contained in chapter one of part two of our constitution and articles nine to 28, which are fundamental rights. So of course it is our duty and we have solemnly affirmed that we will uh, uh, uphold that, you know, or, or perform that duty. And what else I uh, see us doing? In fact, I will just recite uh, in, uh, in, in supervising the, uh, the functioning of the uh, Human Rights Division, I'll just recite the first four or five functions that they have, which we are duty bound to supervise and enforce. Firstly, the review of, the review of human rights situation in the country including implementation of laws, policies, and measures. Number two, coordination of activities of ministries, divisions, and provincial governments in respect of human rights and facilita facilitation of functions relating to human rights. Number three, initiatives for harmonizing legislation, regulations, and practices with the international human rights conventions and agreements to which Pakistan is a party and monitoring their implementation. Number four, obtaining information, documents, and reports on complaints and allegations of human rights violations uh, from ministries, divisions, provincial governments, and other agencies. And number five, lastly, referring and recommendation, recommending investigations and inquiries in respect of any incident of violation of human rights, including rights of disadvantaged and child rights. So I appeal to everybody here. I invite everybody here <clears throat> and everybody you know, if any of if you feel in any of these domains, uh, any matter is worthy of attention and being acted upon, you feel free to write to me, write to any senator and it will be referred to me, write to the chairman senate and it will be referred to me. And in all these subject areas, including the particular subject area of, uh, you know, uh, crimes against women or gender-based violence, and uh, we, will, we will, to the best of our ability, uh, up, uphold and enforce our constitutional and legal and procedural duty and Absolutely, at the tailpiece, there was there were uh, a couple of panelists here who mentioned uh, about devolution, who talked about devolution and said, you know, after the 18th Amendment, it, at the time of the enactment of the 18th Amendment, the two major opposition parties now, who were the two major parties in Parliament then, in their infinite wisdom, kept three subjects, criminal law, criminal procedure and evidence, under Article 142 of the Constitution, as matters that are an, in the concurrent domain. And it is because of that, for example, that before this very Committee of Human Rights, I was not chairing it or a member of it at that time, when the Zainab Alert Bill came, it was meant to be only for the Islamabad Capital Territory, but one of the PPP senators said that we should apply it for the whole of Pakistan. And ha happily and luckily, uh, that, uh, uh, that possibility is there because of Article 142 of the Constitution, which contains matters which are still uh, involving concurrent jurisdiction, which relates to um, subject matter of federal and provincial laws. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, and just the last, and I apologize for a very brief uh, comment from Ms. Reem. As a uh, UN repertoire, what would be your uh, advice or recommendations to Pakistan in effective implementation on the laws on rape? So we have to recognize that any law, no matter how good it is, it's affected by the surrounding context of different forms of discrimination and gender-based violence against women, uh, as uh, myths and stereotyping by the media and the justice system, which uh, Mr. Walid Iqbal and other speakers have alluded to. And in fact, in that sense, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women had stated uh, in its views that it expressed uh, in 2010 on the landmark rape cases, case Vertido versus the Philippines, that myths and stereotypes had affected in that particular case the victim's right to a fair trial, and that the trial judge had focused on the personality and the behavior of the victim, uh, and also had uh, insisted on the lack of evidence of physical resistance. So what we know is that even when there are good laws, rape is frequently not reported. And when it is reported, it is seldomly not prosecuted. And when it is prosecuted, it seldomly leads to convictions. So there are structural 
normative and policy factors that need to accompany the implementation of a law so that the impunity of perpetrators can really be challenged. So there we heard, of course, about capacity building, education, both formal and informal, that needs to, to take place. And I echo that because what we need is really a whole of uh, society approach. I also wanted to re-emphasize um, the issue of lack of consent that it made central to the criminalization of rape, since it influences something else we didn't really talk about, which is the standard of proof. And when the definition of rape is, is based on this lack of consent, the burden with respect to proof is shared with the perpetrator or at least shifts in part to the perpetrator, which is uh, fairer from one that requires a standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, uh, criminal provisions on rape should also specify the circumstances under which the determination of lack of consent is not required or where consent is actually not possible. So, for example, when an accuser is temporarily or permanently incapacitated because of drugs or alcohol. We should also pay attention to the issue of re-victimization, which has been mentioned, and uh, that can happen also when the victim is forced to enter into contact with the perpetrator or is forced to testify in the presence of the perpetrator. It can also occur, as we heard, when we, we have victim blaming biases. And in that respect, I, I should mention that it's good that some states have passed legislation that uh, tries to prevent that. So for example, preventing the use of a victim's sexual history to undermine the credibility of uh, their claim. Uh, we talked about the consent issue that uh, legalizing uh, legislation should establish the consent of children below the age of 15 or 16 is immaterial. And also uh, it should have an extraterritorial application as otherwise prosecution may be precluded in cases of rape committed by citizens in other states, including those serving in peacekeeping missions abroad, which of course is the case also for Pakistan, if it, it does participate in peacekeeping missions. And um, last but not least, I would say that the crime of, of rape should be prosecuted ex officio. In other words, it should not be wholly dependent upon the victim's complaint and the discretionary powers of prosecutors should not be uh, too wide. Now, all this, uh, and since Valerie spoke of good practice, is highlighted uh, in the model uh, legislation of rape that the mandate of the Special Rapporteur has, uh, has produced in 2021, and it is also publicly available. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. al Salim. I'd like to thank all the esteemed panelists uh, for their time. Apologies to the next panelists, uh, but just to thank you to audience and thank you to the Asma Jangi Law Conference. And again, I'd like to re-emphasize if you'd like to tweet about this, hashtag AJConf21. Thank you, everyone, so much.